Jackson Hinkle. Jackson, thanks uh, as always for uh, joining us. I'm now your biggest fan uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Um, let's, uh, let's dive first into that point. Um, is it a synonym uh, that to be a patriotic American, you've got to support American empire overseas? Or is the real patriotism uh, the demand to pay attention to the multitude of problems faced by the American people in their own country? A great question. First, I want to say thank you so much for having me on. I'm a big fan of your show and all your work. Uh, but the, it's a great question. I call myself a patriot because I want to make America better. And I think that we should be working as Americans to improve the lives of our neighbors and improving the standard of living in this country, right? In our, in our founding documents of this country, we're guaranteed a set of basic rights that the government is supposed to uphold. I don't think they're doing a very good job of it. In fact, I think the Biden administration right now is trying to take away those rights. And as citizens of this country, it's our duty to uphold uh, the government's, uh, you know, constitutional, uh, you know, promise that they will guarantee those rights to us. And if they don't, it is our duty to either alter or abolish this government. OK, so that's why I call myself a patriot. I don't think it's that radical. And I think the only thing that is radical or extreme or delusional is for the people who are doing the most unpatriotic things imaginable, uh, corruption in government, taking away those basic rights or waging imperialist for profit wars. I think those are the true people who are doing unpatriotic things, but they claim this label of patriotism. And that really frustrates me. Yeah, uh, I mean, un-American activities uh, are, are, are defined always from the McCarthyite uh, side and perspective. But in fact, uh, the un-American activities, i.e. those activities that are harmful to Americans, are conducted by the people who uh, align with McCarthyism. Um, we, we have, though, the situation, I mean, there's a lot of political cross-dressing going on, Jackson. Uh, the, the sage, uh, Noam Chomsky, has just hailed as the only statesman who is trying to bring about a negotiated end to the Ukraine war is Donald J. Trump. Yes, I mean, the first time I came on your show, I believe we were talking about Ukraine, and you asked me the question, if Donald Trump was president, do you think that we would be at war right now or in a proxy war in Ukraine against Russia? And I said, probably not. I don't think so. And now, based on Trump's most recent statement on the war in Ukraine, it's very clear that he wouldn't have wanted this war. He's saying that, the, you know, the number one thing that politicians and statesmen should be doing right now is advocating for peace, advocating for a peace deal, some sort of negotiation. Russia has been trying that for uh, many, many years now, especially the last eight years. They didn't want this war. They were backed into a corner. And truly, they had no other option. I mean, there, as we all know, there was an eight-year war led by these extremists on the ground in eastern Ukraine that were waging a, a brutal slaughtering campaign against the rebels in the eastern uh, region of the country or in the Donbass, right? So I think that it's incredible that Donald Trump has come out and said this. I recently had U.S. Army Colonel uh, Douglas McGregor on my show. He was Trump's senior Pentagon advisor, and he echoed the same concern. He says, we shouldn't be involving ourselves in this situation. It's our fault as, a U as the United States that this is even happening right now. And in fact, he said, if Donald Trump was president, this would be the last thing that he wanted. Yes, of course, he was oftentimes either uh, knowingly or unknowingly deceived by these deep state figures like John Bolton or Mike Pompeo, for example. But there was many instances in which he tried to fight against them, notably in Syria. He wanted to draw down the troop levels in Syria and a U.S. deep state Syria envoy named James Jeffries lied about the amount of troops that they were keeping in Syria and told Trump that they were drawing down the levels there. 
I mean, this is the type of stuff that we think of as treasonous, but those in power right now think of a patriotic duty to serve their country. I mean, it's insane, but it truly does show that there was a, a deep schism between Donald Trump and these deep state aligned anti-China, anti-Russia officials. Donald Trump is, uh, I'm sure he calls himself a patriotic American, and maybe he says a lot of things that we, you and me don't agree with. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize that he is far more rational when it comes to a lot of these foreign policy disputes than anyone in the Biden administration right now. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, the Democrats, uh, uh, is it bloodier to go on or to go our? Uh, they're steeped in blood so far uh, in the Ukraine. It's difficult to see how the current government of the United States, short perhaps of an electoral cataclysm in November and the loss of control of the Congress, uh, can be diverted from its current profligate, murderous course. It's something to think about. But one thing I want to bring up is that Joe Biden's approval rating just hit 33 percent in a Quinnipiac poll. That's lower than Trump's approval rating ever was. And I think that a lot of Americans might not resonate with the message of the GOP or anything like that. But they understand that in this point in time, it's probably going to be a better outcome at the end of the day if we were to get at least a check or a balance on the Biden administration in Congress. That's why I think you're going to see this immense red wave uh, sweep through the Senate and the House in the 2022 midterms. Right. We're already seeing these numbers coming out, showing that the Republicans are going to take a sweeping victory. And listen, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. In fact, I, I've probably voted Democrat more than Republican in my life. But things are changing. There's a political realignment going on in this country. And it seems as though the only rational people in D.C. right now are some of these libertarian right wing figures. I mean, we can look at the squad. They were supposed to be uh, the, the progressive heroes that were supposed to answer our problems and fight against the Democratic Party. AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, some of these characters. But now they're going along with everything that Nancy Pelosi and Biden wants. They're just this week. You know, there was only 10 people who voted against sending more arms to Ukraine in this suicide mission of a war. And there was only 10 Republicans that voted against it. Every single Democrat, including the squad, voted to send more arms to Ukraine rather than advocate for bringing about a peace proposal like Donald Trump was talking about. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the coming uh, years, really, and leading up to this presidential election. I think uh, I think we can expect a huge uh, sweep of power in the direction of the GOP, because at the end of the day, again, regardless of whether we agree with them all the time or not, they are speaking more truth when it comes to these foreign policy disputes. I can't resist. Jackson, where do you stand on the uh, the big uh, Johnny Depp trial? Uh, it's getting uh, quite a lot of publicity over here. You may or may not be surprised to know. Yeah, it, it's getting a lot of publicity here as well. I mean, I live in Los Angeles and it was so odd. Just a few nights ago, I was at a friend's house in, in downtown L.A. It just so happened we were in one of the buildings that is of major consequence in the trial. Um, I think it's called like the Eastern Building in Los Angeles. But everyone's talking about it. I personally haven't given it a whole lot of attention. I think it's just another bright, shiny object that the media is trying to distract us with. I mean, first it was Russiagate, then it was COVID, then it's Ukraine, now it's this. And what I do think is so interesting about this trial, and you know, Johnny Depp is accusing Ms. Heard of uh, slanderous claims surrounding him being an de alleged domestic abuser, and we know uh, Ms. Heard's claims in the past. What I think is so interesting about this is it's causing a lot of people, at least in the United States, I don't know, about where you are, but it's causing a lot of people to question our culture, question what we value, question what we think of as the pinnacle of happiness, right? Do we think that being famous and, and you know, now seeing what's going on between Ms. Heard and Mr. Depp as the pinnacle of happiness? I don't think so. I think that we are all recognizing the fallibility in every human, not just uh, in our own personal lives as non-celebrities, but also in their lives as well. And the other thing I think it is causing many people to reflect on 
is that the world is not black and white and we shouldn't think about any of these major mainstream media stories that they're shoving down our throats as being black and white. Again, look at Russiagate. Mueller was supposed to be the hero in the eyes of the media, and Trump was the villain. COVID, we had Fauci celebrated as the hero. Uh, Ukraine, we have Zelensky as the hero. The, the undemocratic, corrupt, villainous Zelensky, they told us he was a hero. Now we're seeing this transfer over to this major, um, private, dramatic relationship between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard kind of take the same routes. The media is trying to paint this as black and white, good versus bad, hero versus villain, I think a lot of people are recognizing and reflecting on this based upon our own personal struggles and our own relationships that we've had, that the world is not black and white. Great answer. Jackson Henkel, thank you very much indeed for joining us.